Good morning, everyone. <laughs> and thank you for coming. Uh, and thank you for everyone who's streaming this at all our other hospitals. Um, this morning, uh, I would like to present Dr. Yanni Agostides, who uh, is a professor in uh, anesthesiology and critical care at University of Pennsylvania. Um, he uh, has some expertise in um, cardiac intervention, and uh, his interests are um, uh, perioperative echocardiography, uh, uh, cardiac interventional procedures, um, EICU, and um, he is also a uh, member of the editorial board for the Journal of Cardiothoracic uh, Anesthesiology and um, is a regular reviewer for leading journals in cardiovascular uh, uh, journals in uh, all over the world. And he will be talking to us uh, this morning on uh, highlights of cardiac uh, thoracic anesthesia. And I would like to introduce Dr. Yanni Agostides. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody. It's wonderful to be here. Um, I was reading about Michael DeBake as a medical student. Uh, so it's very, it's wonderful to be here where so many giants uh, have, uh, have walked and continue to uh, basically lead, lead cardiovascular medicine. Um, and this, uh, this is a talk I've been giving for about 10 years around the world and started a series um, in my journal, the uh, Journal of Cardiothoracic and Vascular Anesthesia. Um, and increasingly the borders, I think what you're gonna appreciate um, is increasingly we need to work together. So if you wanna get up right now and go, and the take home message from the talk is that the boundaries between cardiac surgery, uh, cardiology in all its uh, subspecialties and cardiothoracic anesthesiology in the ICU are all melting. And, 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 and the, the common uh, problem or the challenge that leading um, service lines like yours and ours and others around the world face is how do we navigate this new, this new space and how do we work together to take, to take it to the next level? Because, you know, when Michael DeBakey started, there was only one option, right? A Dacron graft. Uh, there wasn't an endovascular stent, for example. Um, so you'll see in the th as we look at valvular disease, coronary disease, and heart failure, there's, there are multiple options for a problem. And the key is now is not for one person or one decision maker in, in a silo to decide what should happen. Most people think now that it should be a, a, a heart team picking, looking at the patient together in real time and, and making a decision what medical and what mechanical therapy. And I think that's the take home message. So without further ado, let's, um, let's get started. Obviously a titan, but, and you can, I don't need no introduction here. Um, we're gonna start with valvular heart disease. And I think this paper really caught my attention because it makes the case, as you can see in, from Jack, that aortic stenosis is really uh, serious, particularly when it starts to involve the right side of the heart, when you start to have primary hypertension. And so in these symptomatic patients with this echo grading, you can see that um, very quickly, you don't really want to wait till you get to stage three and four because you can see the outcomes significantly deteriorate. So this, this, this really empowers echocardiography to stage aortic stenosis carefully and to, and to guide timing of intervention, whether it's uh, transcatheter aortic valve replacement or surgical. And I think this is moving the bar. And the same group in a second paper in Jack also uh, looked at asymptomatic patients looking at uh, this classification. And you can see the definitions and the same curves. Three and four really uh, predict uh, unacceptable outcomes for many people. And so I think the whole discussion about AS is and timing is moving away from clinical symptoms to echo, echo cardiographic uh, <coughs> staging as to when to intervene. So I think that's a big change in the way we're gonna preoperatively decide when to, when to intervene on the valve. Secondly, this, this hot off the press, um, this randomized trial, again, makes the point, don't wait uh, when you have severe aortic stenosis. 
replace the valve. And so this is a, a big endorsement for Savar. And what about Tavar? So for those of you who um, spend a lot of time, you'll know this is Louis Cribrier, who started the whole revolution in 2002 in Rouen, France. And very quickly, we have, uh, as you see here, a wonderful uh, staged approach. I think most of us would say at a, at, a, at a leading center like yours, you're probably here already, where there's a mature um, state with uh, Tavar and Sauer getting sort of balanced uh, decision making. Um, there's an established pathway, which I'm sure is operating here, as, as well as uh, at other leading centers with a heart valve team. You'll keep hearing that word, team. Uh, again, notice a blend of surgeons, cardiologists, anesthesiologists. Um, and most of us would like to be in this green zone over here where we have uh, a reasonable volume and uh, superior outcomes. And, and this is pretty much how, I think in the 2020s, how uh, you know, payers are going to look at, uh, at a Tavros Center. This is the matrix uh, that they're going to use. Um, Couple of strong messages though. Even at a mature program, frailty is important. Um, even with a simple scale like this, low extremity strength, cognitive function, anemia, and serum albumin, you can see very quickly how your one year outcomes are almost futile in patients who are very frail. So, a very powerful message, you know, in very frail patients, uh, Tavar or Savar perhaps doesn't make a whole lot of sense. There's been this relentless storm of clinical trials that, you've, that we all know about, taking us now into the low-risk era. And just remember that it's the STS perioperative risk of mortality score. Less than 4% is considered low risk. 4 to 8% is intermediate risk. And of course, when we back in the early days with partner one and two, we talked about really high risk, like 8 to 12, and extreme risk beyond 12. We're now in the 0 to 4% range. Patients typically 60 to 80 years old. You can see that for the balloon expandable valve, the S3 family, and so on, it's, it, and also for the core valve, the self-expanding family, very reasonable alternative to, um, to surgical aortic valve replacement. Um, even at five years, hot off the press from the New England Journal. And this is the intermediate risk group, so 4 to 8%, five years out. Um, I won't dive into this detail. Um, you're welcome to look it up on your smartphone. But this is the take-home message. It's equivalent. And so the burning question now, I think, is for most of us, is what, what's the longevity of these valves? I think any patient with aortic stenosis is really a candidate. Um, but um, there are a couple of limitations. We'll talk about this. Uh, Dr. Reardon, of course, who... Uh, made some very, very thoughtful comments at the STS just a few weeks ago, and uh, we'll go through that. But aside from the, some of the limitations of these trials, the big question is, you know, how long does it last? Uh, but I can tell you, um, one person or two people in this room have bicuspid aortic valve disease. It, ten, it runs in my father's family, and, uh, you know, several of my cousins have, have, in their 40s and 50s, have already chosen tissue valves. And they said to me, well, we don't really it doesn't really matter because I'm just going to have a valve in valve whenever my time comes. So, you know, out on the street around the world, the patients have already made a decision. The trials will just tell us, you know, whether it's 10 years or 15 years or however long it is. But I think uh, most people, most middle-aged adults are, are choosing tissue valves. And uh, we're not implanting a lot of mechanical valves. Um, um, in fact, it's getting rare. Um, I'm forgetting what they look like on echocardiography, to be honest with you. Anyway, this continues to be an issue, um, AI. Um, so any degree, you know, more than mild, uh, it continues to be a powerful predictor of adverse outcome. I think with the third generation transcatheter valves, it's less of an issue, which explains why, you know, as you see in, in our meta-analysis, uh, you know, we began to look at why the migration of away from general anesthesia to local. I know there's still some islands around the country that you know, get, are very emotionally attached to general anesthesia, but uh, you know, in our paper in circulation, Prakash Patel led the anesthesia side, um, Jay Jiri is from Penn Cardiology. Uh, you know, we very clearly showed from the TVT registry 
that you know conscious sedation is definitely catching on, and this is already two to three years old. You know, we're thinking about updating it now, um, but you can see it's growing in popularity and it's reasonable in transfemoral TAVR. And the outcomes were actually better in the study, but we think that was more selection bias because it was still the adoption phase. And so the, you know, but we will have patients routinely now who have, you know, severe pulmonary hypertension, low EFs, and we do them, uh, you know, with uh, dexmedetomidine infusion, maybe a little remifentanil in the background, and it goes very, very well. Um, and we looked at this sort of around the world. I was interested particularly in the German experience because they, they, they tend to be five or ten years ahead of us in because the, the valves got approved there much earlier. And this was their experience uh, um, as well. So the brain actually has become the new frontier. This is an MRI with diffusion weighted imaging. We really want to avoid a large embolic stroke like this. What can we do in Tavar? This has prompted the Neurology Consortium to actually redefine um, the way they think of stroke in cardiovascular trials. So the, the, real, um, the real science now to rescue the brain has arrived because now we've got endpoints to drive safety trials and effective, tri effective effic efficacy trials, uh, type 1 being overt injury, type 2 is covert injury. The patient's fine, but when you look at the MRI, there are multiple embolic strokes all over the brain. What does that mean? And then, of course, you know, in the ICU, we see this type 3 with uh, delirium or a few hours of, of a TIA. Um, but I think this language is, is setting the platform for some major trials that are coming in the 2020s. They're going to transform the way we do the cases uh, from the brain protection perspective. It's no longer about the valve. We know we can replace the valve. We know we can do a job very well in almost everybody. So now the question is, what about making sure the patient doesn't have a stroke? Or, um, and, and downstream will be renal failure and so on as things mature. Um, and this, in, you know, as you probably know, embolic protection is well established already in, in carotid uh, angioplasty. This is one of the devices that's gotten, that's gotten some traction in this part of the world. The sentinel device floated typically through the right radial artery parked under fluoroscopic guidance with one basket at the takeoff of the innominate, second one at the takeoff of the left common carotid. It still leaves the left posterior circulation vulnerable here because it doesn't protect the left subclavian. But nevertheless, it, uh, it's pretty much become routine at our, at, at, in, our, uh, in our shop. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's a first generation device, um, but they're going to get better. In immediate post-procedure, you're off your table or the patient has a stroke, you can call a stroke alert. They'll do a CTA. They'll tell you that there's a large embolus in the second branch of the middle cerebral artery, and they're going to go get it. They go and assess neuroradiology, float a catheter, and pull it out. The patient starts to move uh, the left uh, side of uh, the left hemiparesis goes away. We've had a couple cases like that already, uh, both after open uh, you know, cardiac procedures as well. So rescue um, in the early postoperative period is also something that is now uh, gaining a lot of traction. Um, and the neuro neurologists are having to redefine, you know, their stroke team and how they handle this. Downstream, you know, patients at home taking aspirin and Plavix, and you worry about thrombus burden on the valves. There's a language that's emerging in cardiac imaging, which I think you have to follow. Uh, one of them is uh, HALT, hypoattenuating leaflet thickening, and of course, reduced leaflet motion. And this got a lot of attention uh, just a few weeks ago um, with this CT imaging guided scale, zero to four. Um, and you can basically see what they're getting at is what's the um, uh, thrombus burden on the valve? Because the, the hypothesis is that the little pieces are breaking off and causing the strokes that we see at six months or 12 months. And so the question is, well, what about a Zaban, what about a, a novel oral anticoagulant like a factor 10A, so the Zaban family, does that really make a difference or not in terms of stroke? And unfortunately, as you see here, hot off the press, it seems to um, actually add to the risk. So the concept of aspirin and rivaroxaban or a Zaban only, uh, I don't think is going to get traction based on this trial. I think we're still stuck with double platelet, 
blockade, whether it's aspirin and Plavix or Prasugrel, whatever the trials are going are gonna to tell us. And maybe, you know, and if you have a FIB, maybe it'll be Coumadin, but you'll have to do, you know, a, a bleeding score to decide if it's going to be Coumadin, aspirin, and Plavix, or just Coumadin, and aspirin, and so on. So that's kind of where we are with this. But I think this, this concept uh, is going to be the standard for, for judging, um, besides clinical endpoints, which uh, antithrombotic or antiplatelet strategy makes the most sense as we go forward. This paper, you know, really makes the point that AS, any way you look at it, severe AS, moderate AS, uh, asymptomatic AS, in, for non-cardiac procedures is a serious risk, not for so much for mortality, but for just major adverse uh, events. Um, so much so that this group have launched a trial looking at um, TAVR, in the setting of moderate AS, defined as 1 to 1.5 square centimeters, and LV dysfunction. You can see the natural history is awful. Um, you know, this concept of watching moderate AS in somebody who has an LVEF of 20% uh, doesn't make sense, right? Because we give them all these afterload reducers, but we leave them mechanically blocked. So the, I, I think this is a fantastic uh, trial. Uh, it's obviously ongoing. I, I, would, I wouldn't be surprised if TAVR makes a huge difference in the natural history, and it would probably, well, we'll wait and see, but I wouldn't be surprised if there's an expanding indication for uh, TAVR in moderate AS, in, in high-risk groups like this. So keep, keep an eye on that. No surprise with imaging. Um, a TE has really become the platform now, the 3D interventional echo. Uh, it's really the platform that's gonna take us through the 2020s, for mitral clips and other mitral valve interventions. You can see the, all the platforms that are being tested right now. It's just a matter of time before one or two of them gain traction, like the mitral clip. Uh, the right side is no longer forgotten. There's a whole family of interventions that are being looked at for repair and replacement. And so I think it's safe to say that all four valves are going to be transcatheter candidates in the next decade, just depending on which platforms uh, get, get some traction. So the summary there is that, um, you know, we're in the transcatheter era, and there are now surgical and transcatheter options for, for valve disease. And really sorting out which procedure for which patient seems to be best done in a, in a, in a sort of a heart team model. Um, and and those, those centers that can, uh, you know, stay rooted in that paradigm and that philosophy, will probably navigate the next decade very, very successfully. Because these platforms relentlessly just, just, just come. And, and so you need to have a culture of embracing trials, being critically uh, open to changing your practice as things, uh, as innovations roll in. In coronary disease, uh, you know, again, Michael DeBakey did the first aorta coronary procedure. So where are we 50 years later? This is a fantastic read about Rene Favaloro at the uh, Cleveland Clinic. He was sort of a, another champion of surgical revascularization. Um, the trials tell us a few things. Firstly, again, notice teamwork. It's very, very important in your, in your cabbage program. Um, you know, to, to, keep, to, to, keep, uh, to keep yourself at the top of the pile, you need to look at what you do before the OR, what you do in the OR, what you do in the ICU, and what you do before you send the patient home. It's not just what you do in the OR that's important. And I think the trials are reasonably clear, bilateral memory graphs. There are some, you know, this is the British experience, didn't really add any outcome advantage. Uh, we, you know, we still, we don't use them very much because of the risk of sternal wound infection. We definitely don't use them in diabetics. And so I don't think a Beamer approach is going to gain a lot of traction in North America based on this experience. What about on-pump versus off-pump? Um, well, the, the, as you can see, the outcomes are pretty similar. Most surgeons that I speak to around the country prefer being on-pump because in terms of teaching, it's, it's just a, a whole lot less stressful, number one. Number two, you, the, you've got perfect conditions for all your graphs. Um, and so really, in, um, in, at least in, 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 uh, around, the, this, around this country, it's, uh, I think on-pumps here to stay. I think there will be some, you know, 
champions of off pump. But in a developing world, um, South Sub Saharan Africa, where I grew up, as you can hear my South African accent, uh, India, where they do thousands and thousands of, of, of cabbage species every year, um, off pump is the way to go. Because the surgeons there are, you know, are very skilled, and it's so much cheaper. You don't need perfusion, you don't need bypass, and so on tight budgets, they can really get a lot of patients revascularized and revascularized very well. So, for you know, and that's not really addressed in these trials. They don't look at the economics of it. They just look at the pure, you know, clinical endpoints. So it depends where you where you are in the world. So don't rush to judgment. You know, off pump done very well. Is, 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 is a very good procedure. Um, but in terms of the science, um, you know, off-pump, especially sort of a no-touch aortic technique, um, definitely can lower your stroke risk in, in, you know, in patients who have you know, advanced um, aortic uh, atheroma. If you want to dive into the details, this is a lovely an, uh, network analysis, and you can, you can look it up in Jack very easily. What about antifibrinolytics? It's been an ongoing saga. Uh, we all remember the aprotonin uh, era. Um, there's still some advocates for aprotonin. We, we essentially haven't used it since, uh, that, you know, since the, it was taken off the market. We are left with Amacar in this country or uh, tranexamic acid in the rest of the world. So this group did you know, 5,000 patients, um, Paul Miles, an Australian group, and looked at um, you know, all the, all the outcomes. And the effect is modest, as you can see here. I mean, it's, it saves you a couple of units of blood. It doesn't give you any mortality advantage. Um, there's a higher seizure risk. Some of our surgeons call it the seizure drug. And so, you know, I, I, I think, it, you know, where does it, where I've gone all over the map with this over my career. And at the present point, I, 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 you know, I don't mind if you use Amacar. I don't mind if you don't. It's more uh, probably... It's useful in a multimodal blood management pathway, say for you know, your primary valve or primary cabbage pathway. Uh, I usually don't use them in, 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 in primary cabbage because we, I, I, I don't transfuse those patients. We typically, we do, a look, we do blood conservation and we don't, we don't use blood. In those, so I've stopped using it um, because I worry more about like, you know, the possibility of... Uh, you know, one of the graphs um, having a thrombotic risk, particularly if, if it's a diabetic, and or the you know the one of the coronaries is intramyocardial. So, um, I um, I've sort of drifted away from this, but this is the evidence, and I know there are some people who feel very strongly about it. PCI. Um, so we're getting away from surgical the surgical update now towards the PCI update. If you like the history, this is a wonderful read about Andreas Grudzik. It was sort of like a blazing uh, Da Vinci in this, you know, as a young man, he basically invented the coronary balloon. This is his first patent. Um, and, you know, did the first cabbage actually in Zurich, in the OR, uh, did the first PCR because the patient was so high risk. And then um, eventually came to Emory and uh, started the whole field. Where are we now, 50 years later? I think cabbage is seeing a renaissance, as you can see. Basically, you know, um, cabbage does offer advantages. This is unprotected left main. This concept that you can PCI anything is, is gone away. I remember in the drug eluding stents when they first came out, everybody, you know, we were all worried that we wouldn't be doing cabbages anymore. Um, our cabbage volume continues to go up. Um, you know, triple vessel disease, diabetics, and so on. Um, and so I think cabbage is definitely here to stay. Again, coming back to that, that heart T model, the patient with coronary disease should be looked at not by a cardiologist only, not by a surgeon, right? Because you go to a barber, you get a haircut, right? If you get looked at by someone who just does PCI, then they're going to like stretch PCI to fit your angiogram. That, that model mm -hmm. seems to have gone away. What people want to now look at is, well, what is your coronary angiogram? Who are you? What's your syntax score? And what what platform really makes sense and why? And then let's do something. So I think that's, um, that's where it's going. Um, the great promise of bioreabsorbable stents unfortunately hasn't materialized. I was really hoping this would because especially perioperative, you know, putting in a fresh stent and with a thrombotic risk, 
with a drug eluding scent, even if it's second generation, even though it's less, and the guidelines say only six months of dual antiplatelet therapy, it would be fantastic if you could put a stent in, it poisoned the endothelium, the endothelium stopped dividing, and then three months later it just disappeared, and you were left with an open coronary artery that can be covered by native endothelium that's tame, so it doesn't grow in and get re So you've got tamed endothelium um, and no thrombotic risk. And you can come for non-cardiac surgery and there's no big, no, big, no big issue. But unfortunately, even though it makes beautiful sense, when you talk about it, as you see, there's a high risk. And so I don't, I'm not sure where we're going to go with it, but for now, it's, it's on ice. In heart failure, so again, in coronary disease, you can see whether it's medical or surgical revascularization. The concept is, uh, again, sort of a T model. Um, and so the leaders of, of you know, major service lines, I think, are really um, embracing this um, as we go forward. Because especially in the era that we're in now, where our outcomes are so tightly looked at, and where increasingly patients are able to go online, it's like you buy a car or a fridge or a house, uh, you know, you can, you're going to start looking up, where can I have my cabbage? How do they make the decisions? What are the outcomes? And, and so that's probably where things are going. Heart failure. Um, again, um, the medical side has been relentless. I mean, you can see here just a declining mortality. The spin-off for us that in the OR and sometimes in the cath lab is a lot of these patients are on these very powerful afterload-reducing re agents. The angiotensin converting enzymes, the angiotensin receptor blockers, um, you know, the new one, the, the combined with neprilysin inhibitor, sacobutrol. Um, and so some of these people get profoundly vasoplegic when they're exposed to bypass or, and, uh, and anesthesia. And, and so there's been an emergence of some silver bullets, which I, I, I don't have the time to go into, but there's a substantial literature now around vasopressin for rescue, methylene blue for rescue, and even um, hydroxycobalamin, vitamin B12. You may know that in the ER as rescue for cyanide poisoning. This is it's a great it's a great presser in that situation, and so we actually have a protocol now for when to use these drugs. Um, and I think it's a spin-off of just you know the tremendous medical afterload reduction for patients with hypertension and heart failure. Of course, Viva Samenden has is, is been knocking on the door for approval in the United States for a long time. It's been used in millions and millions of patients outside the United States. It's an inodilator. It's a calcium sensitizer. Um, it improves inotropy. It, it decreases systemic vascular resistance. It's got the same hemodynamics as uh, milrinone. And so, you know, these trials looked at its effects after cardiac surgery. No advantage there. Uh, what about in, in, in LV dysfunction? Unfortunately, also equivalent. So, you know, unfortunately, I, I was hoping they would find a difference that we could actually start to use the drug here because it's a really great drug. Uh, but unfortunately, I don't think we'll be seeing it. It's still expensive, and, you know, the evidence doesn't suggest we really need it. Uh, heart transplantation. Of course, I'm from Cape Town. Um, it's a very sensitive issue. I know Chris Barnard. But put the history aside, the first heart transplant was done in Cape Town. And... Um, as you can see, and this is the anesthesiologist who actually worked with my dad. My dad was actually part of this team. And um, he got the, you know, a gold medal from the president of South Africa at the time. This is Kruiskia Hospital. That's why I went to medical school. And this is the anesthesia record. I, <laughs> I mean, just very, very, uh, very different to what we do now. Um, if you're in Cape Town, this is 1967, so, um, you know, if you're in Cape Town, it's a beautiful place to visit. Many people think it's the most beautiful city in the world. Um, take a t look up the Heart Museum. It's at Kruiski Hospital. They've actually kept the original OR, and it's sort of uh, it's a wonderful experience to walk through if you you know if you're in cardiovascular medicine. You will get a shock when you walk into the operating room. You see like you know the the anesthesia machine. It looks it's, you would never anesthetize somebody with that thing. <laughs> You look at the bypass machine. I mean, it's amazing what they were able to do. Absolutely amazing. Um, but be that as it may, you know, we're obviously now in the third generation VAD era, you know, heart mate, heart wear, whatever you, you believe in. 
uh, but you know they both work very very well. I think there's obviously a drift away from axial flow because of thrombosis. You know pump exchanges that we used to do so often before you know 2017, 2018. Those are going away because more and more people are just putting in this, this centripetal flow. So I think you know it's safe to say the third generation is here. But now what's happened is we have this because of all these innovations. In, in circulatory support. We have a menu. We have ECMO, we have LVAD, we have different kinds of LVADs, we have balloon pumps. You can see that from the Intermax data, uh, you know, these mechanical therapies are being embraced. How do we integrate the management of this, you know, depending on um, acuity here and, um, and ultimately bridging where? Bridging to transplant, bridging to destination. Um, this, this is a very, very uh, good read from the ACC, um, looking at MCS in the, in the cath lab, but I think it speaks to something that uh, is actually more important, and that is, what's the best approach to shock? So we, you know, a couple of places around the country now have shock teams. So when they get a referral, you know, it's not a cardiologist saying, oh, okay, I'm going to go to the cath lab and do what I do, you know. Impeller and uh, PCR, and then that doesn't go well. Then he calls the surgeon and says, "Hey, by the way, I've got X, Y, and Z." What's happening now? Well, likewise, the surgeon, right, will call the cardiologist after the things don't go well. So, what's happening now is you have a, like a little committee that can have like a, a quick conference call. Patient X with uh, details A through Z. Uh, where should we send him in the system? What? Should we go to the ICU first? Should we go to the cath lab first? Should we go to the OR first? What other studies do we need? And so the patient arrives actually triaged very, uh, very well. And I think that's going to allow us to better decide, you know, which of these uh, therapies um, actually make sense. Um, and as somebody who works a lot in the heart and vascular ICU, you know, it's... It's, it's really, it really made, it's making a huge difference because um, it, it, all the stakeholders are now aligned. So when the patient arrives, I know who the patient is. I know what, I know, I've, I've, I've talked to the, the shock team and I, I have a, a very clear idea what the rationale is for managing this patient. Why we want to do ECMO and, 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 or why we want to do Impella or both and so on. And I think that's going to make a huge difference. Um, or why we don't want to do anything. Right, someone who um, who is in advanced shock, who has so many comorbidities that it doesn't matter what you do, this is the end of the road. And you know, and adding another two or three weeks in the ICU with you know ten or twelve machines is not necessarily the way to go. Um, and so I think having a little bit more discernment, a little bit more of a team approach, um, so that actually we manage the technology rather than the technology managing us. Just because you can do ECMO, VV, VA, or uh, VAV, what, whatever platform you're thinking about, doesn't mean you necessarily have to. Um, and that's, uh, I think, a, uh, if you're interested in some of the details of this, every, every January we publish the update. This is now number 12. It just came out. It's a group of us around, around the country. So well, uh, welcome to look into the details online. Some of, the, some of the latest bits and pieces that have been coming up, as you can see here, this was uh, from Dr. Reardon's uh, observations from at STS. Um, I don't know if he's in the audience, but okay. But you can see that, um, you know, again, this discernment that I was talking about is very, very important. So that you manage the information and you, 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 you integrate the trials into your practice. You can see here, that, for example, we didn't test enough young people, right? So if you're 30, if you're 40 years old, Tavor necessarily is an option, but the trials didn't really answer the questions you may be interested in because the average age, as you can see here, in the Evolute Partner 3 and Partner 2A trials was, you know, 70 or so, 70 to 80. So, um, you know... And your goals in life when you're 70 or 80 are obviously different to your goals in life when you're 40 or 50, and you're expecting to live, you know, hopefully 80, 90 years. So um, things are, 
you, you know, and also what about patients who are excluded, you know, the exclusions, we just don't know what happened to them. So, you know, trials are, trials are great, um, and obviously we need them, but you also need to pay attention to what the limitations are um, and not rush to judgment uh, just based on, uh, on, on randomized trials where things are very strictly controlled. And, and that's why there's a, a whole family of trials now called pragmatic trials where they actually want to get closer to real-world conditions, you know, to tell us what to do. Um, there's a whole... Um, I mean, you, you know, you're a leading center. You're obviously on the cutting edge here. So, you know, Elsa is coming to Houston. Um, I just got another email about the there's a uh, the nursing leadership here is going to have a whole discussion about structural heart disease. So, it was a lovely segue to actually um, come and talk. Of course, uh, Professor Bass with uh, with Mighty. So, I'm really preaching to the choir. I think a lot of some of this, but I think what's um, this, this is uh, William Penn in, uh, in Philly. Um, you know, I wanted to finish a, a touch early because I think there's a lot, there are a lot of questions to talk about. Um, you know, I think being a cardiovascular medicine is very exciting. I don't think we've ever had this uh, number of, of therapies um, going, going on. I think there are huge implications for training. Um, certainly as someone who has a deep interest in training in cardiothoracic anesthesiology, how do we redesign our fellowship to, 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 to train uh, our future generations, given that you know, in the last 10 years, um, most of what I do, I was never taught uh, during fellowship, even in my first 10 years in attending. And 90% of what I do now, I taught myself, 3D echo, uh, all the new platforms in heart and vascular ICU. I didn't do a critical care fellowship, uh, but I've been working in the ICU for 20 years. So, you know, um, things move very quickly, and I think our training, at least in anesthesia, needs to catch up with uh, where we are. Um, but how to get there is, 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 is going to be a roundtable discussion. But I'm sure the same, th you know, um, I read a lot of the surgical literature because I'm on the editorial board for the Journal of Thoracic and Cardiovascular Surgery. And, um, you know, I can tell you the debates are going on there too as to how to redesign education in, ca in cardiothoracic surgery and, uh, and interventional cardiology as well. Thank you very much. Um, any questions? I have a few that, can, that may get the discussion going if there are no, no uh, burning questions. Go ahead. Sure. Well, you know, I think the one the one question that's come up a lot, based on you know the lovely group I went out to dinner with, um, is, you know, how do we deal with the acuity in in, in, the, in the intensive care unit? Um, now, you know, the heart and vascular intensive care unit where I work, um, the average patient has three or four machines. You know, there's usually a ventilator. There's usually a renal replacement therapy. Uh, there's usually a, a balloon pump or an ECMO or an impeller. And, you know, it, the level of acuity is just, you know, many orders of magnitude higher than almost any other ICU. In fact, when I go to any other, other ICU, it looks like a floor to me. It looks like a, a ward, you know. Um, the patients, many patients are not intubated. Many patients have no machines in the room. Zero. Half the patients don't even have an A-line, and it's called a surgical ICU. You know, they've got a damage control abdomen, and they're all stressed out. You know, but the patient's on, you know, a little bit of norepinephrine and, uh, and talking to you. You know, and I'm like, uh, hmm, don't get this, honestly. With every, my average patient that I'm dealing with is, you know, about 50 times more ill. And I think in terms of staffing models, you know, and there's this role of, you know, remote ICU, um, and how do we integrate that in the unit? And there was a lot of heated discussion about that uh, at dinner. Um, and I think the way forward is actually both are very helpful. What we found in our unit is that um, you have to have a senior, someone senior there all the time. It can be a surgeon, it can be an anesthesiologist. It doesn't matter who it is. It's just somebody who understands at, a, at an advanced level what's going on. Because when you've got someone with three or four machines and something's going on, you can't be on a video machine 
or on a TV screen telling, uh, trying to explain it, because you don't have a lot of time. You've got to walk in the room and start making the changes. And, and when you've made all the changes and the hemodynamics are back, you can then talk about it. Um, and so that's the kind of acuity that we're talking about. So we actually find that having the remote people in there is quite helpful because if one or two in a 40-bed ICU, um, you know, which is more or less the size of yours, um, you know, even with the even with the staffing at night, one or two rooms can get very very busy, and and can pull you away from, a, from keeping an eye on the rest. You know, you may have an ECMO that a patient arrives very sick, you have to go on VA ECMO right there and there. Well, that's going to take you you know a good forty five minutes, maybe longer, and you're going to be in the room cannulating, um, going on ECMO, and you're not necessarily going to be available to walk around and keep an eye on the other patients. So having um, having the you know electronic ICU, the EICU, you know at least watch that is is, is quite helpful. So I, I see them as complementary, but I don't I don't think you can ha not have a senior hands on in a very very acute unit that we have. Um, it just doesn't it just doesn't fit with how sick the patients are. So that's been our experience. Um, I, I don't necessarily know how that will translate here, but um, you know what I do see um, as a spin-off to this is that technology is moving so quickly that we get left behind. You know, a service line, um, even as sophisticated as yours or pens, you kind of have to get external reviews at this point. You know, so like one way through this, if you have an ICU controversy is to actually, there's a group, I can put you in touch with some people as well, but, you know, they, 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 you know, they would have an external review of the ICU. So you have a team of people who visit and just do a 360 on your unit um, and basically will tell you, you know, well, here are some things that you guys should consider, you know. Um, and leading centers have done this around the country, Cleveland, Penn, all of them. Um, maybe your heart transplant program is not as, as buffed as you want. Maybe your lung transplant program isn't as buffed as you want. And so I think part of being a mature service line, especially with all the technology that you see that we've talked about, um, it, you know, how do you integrate that into the service line when it's moving so quickly? And uh, you know, I think an external review um, is not, uh, it's not because you're, you're drowning, but because you're trying to figure out the, how to put the best foot forward. So you're kind of investing in your service line. Um, so I offer that as a, uh, as a, as a trend that I see around the country. Um, as, as leaders who are very, very smart have to, are trying to decide how to, uh, how to keep pace with, um, with, the, with the dynamics in our, in our, in our space. Yes. Ah, oh, got it. One of the cardiology fellows here. Okay. question about this around the country, the shock teams. Mm-hmm. We don't have one yet here, but I imagine in you know, the next several years there will be. Okay. Um, who who's in charge of the shock team, and is this all comers shock? Because I feel like a common, you know, consult on calls will be called to MICU for someone who is maybe presumed septic shock. Mm -hmm. You know, you find out to be mixed shock or more cardiogenic shock. So is, is this a shock team for anyone showing up to the emergency room in shock, or is this like a maybe just people who are thought to be cardiogenic shock, more cardiovascular surgeons, heart failure doctors, cardiac anesthesiologists, or would they also go to pretty much any, anybody coming in in shock? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the, the, current, the current incarnation of pain is more cardiogenic shock, cardiogenic shock with or without any other kind of shock. Um, but I think uh, it should probably move more towards almost, you know, uh, almost uh, most kinds of shock. Because um, what I find is that, you know, the old silo approach where the patient went to the MICU and got started on 100 mics of norepinephrine and, you know, through a peripheral IV, no disrespect to my medical colleagues, but, uh, you know, after you see one or two of those cases, you get, and then you sit on the patient for two weeks, patient, and you look, the patient got intubated, patient developed uh, AKI, now they're on dialysis, and they call you when, you know, the AST is 5,000, and they're like, oh, you know, I'm not sure what we can do now. And you're like, you know, hmm, you know, ECMO a week ago, we made a whole lot of sense, you know, and, and 
you know, so you kind of miss, and, and likewise, you know, I can give you the same example in cardiology where it's PCI, PCI, impeller, because that's all you have, you know, or in surgery where it's just, you know, go back to the OR, open the chest, you know, you, you perseverate with what, with the, with the one or two things that you have. Um, and I think the answer now is to get a team of people together who have, you know, five, ten years experience, um, you know, from surgery, cardiology, and anesthesiology, and maybe medicine and say, okay, you know, this particular patient has, you know, this type of shock and it's best handled probably like this. And maybe ICUs need to, you know, um, morph a little bit. We call ourselves the heart and vascular ICU now. We don't talk about surgery or – I've learned more cardiology in the last five years because, um, you know, all the big MIs that have shock, they come to, they come to our unit. They don't go to the CCU. They come to our unit – they get, and we manage them. And we will, you know, it's balloon pump or it's ECMO, whatever they need. So I think, um, I don't think there's an easy answer to your question, but I, what I do think is we need to get away from, you know, the silo approach, which is what we've had, you know, cardiology versus cardiac surgery, or, um, you know, the cardiologist being called to the MICU, you know, when, when it's, you know, um, patients with multi-system organ failure, and uh, you've missed a window of opportunity. So I think it's a very thoughtful question. I wish there was an easy answer, but I think more and more people are moving towards it, and it's becoming a priority. Like, I, I don't think you should wait for a few years, to be honest. I think this, you should make this a few months, if, if that's my own two cents. I hope I don't upset anybody in the room. But, you know, because it, the, the implications are huge, you know. Uh, it's terrible when you have a patient on VA ECMO and it's like a road to nowhere. You know, the family didn't want it. Patient, uh, you know, now you're on VA ECMO and you've got all these problems. And I mean, you can, you can disengage from that, but it's very messy and very expensive. And why did you even get there, you know? So having a little thought up front, uh, you know, Ben Franklin, who is from Philly, right? Would, I mean, if one of the things he said is an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So I think that's what the shock team gives you. Um, I don't know what your experience has been with pulmonary embolism. Um, I know, you know, the PERT team, the pulmonary embolism response team, is also a very big concept at Penn and other places around the country because the approach to PE is also um, so radically different now with, uh, you know, surgical embolectomy, um, per, you know, percutaneous or transcatheter-based embolectomy, you know, sort of different kinds of... Uh, you know, intravascular vacuum cleaners, you know, they can go and suck the clot out or I'm sure you guys do catheter guided thrombolysis. It's, it's, we've had some amazing cases. I mean, people come in with unbelievable, like, you know, a clot and, you you know, they go to the catheter, they get the little catheters floated and, we you know, we drip in some, uh, some clot buster, streptokinase or whatever you're interested in and, you know, two or three days later the catheters come out and they go home. And you do, you know, and I'll do a bedside echo and the RV, I'll just watch each day, the RV just gets better and better and better as it gets unloaded. Um, so it's very, um, it's very satisfying when you have a team approach like that because it's not perfect, but the patient gets to the right team earlier and gets the right mix of interventions earlier. And I think that's a good recipe for success. But, you know, how do you operationalize that? I think it's a real opportunity for, for you and for the rest of fellows in training to embrace this and kind of think, think a little bit outside the traditional uh, boundaries of your specialty because uh, your mentors may not be able to do that. You know, if you've been in practice in one style, you know, for 20 years, um, then you have a lot of inertia. You know, I had to get rid of my inertia because, uh, you know, the, I like taking care of patients with cardiovascular disease. So I, I had to let go of having one way of doing things a long time ago. So I don't mind uh, changing what I do from one week to the next if, if there's a good reason. I'm all for it. But most people are not as that flexible. Most people like a, you know, this is the way I do it. I've done it like this all the, all the, all the way, and this is the way I'm going to stay with it. Well, that, that may have been cool, I don't know, 10 years ago, maybe five years ago. But cardiovascular medicine is, the train has left the station. 
And we need, we, uh, you know, your generation of providers, uh, they need to be flexible, good communicators, and you need to be open to the idea that your specialty is not always the, can have all the answers. You know, so when you go to the cath lab, you go to the cath lab because it's a good idea to go to the cath lab, not because that's all you know how to do. So, I don't know, longer answer maybe than you wanted, but. That was good, thank you. Sure. Any other? Any other questions? Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, and I think, um, I don't know how this question is. There. Um, I think, uh, well, basically, uh, Yanni and I graduated from medical school probably around the same time, uh, 1989. And <laughs> um, it's, Definitely was the uh, uh, medicine was so different then, and it was very dogmatic. And um, you know, you could be a surgeon walking into the medical ICU, and there are it's like guns were pointed at you. And um, people always wanted to be the alpha dog, and it was very difficult. I think um, there was a lot of uh, it was kind of a dog eat dog mentality, and. <clears throat> I think it's very true that um, uh, we've come together uh, very um, uh, in by boundaries being broken because now vascular surgeons aren't the only ones doing the interventional procedures. Cardiologists also do aortic stents, and you know, and and I think that in. Uh, in training in places like this, uh, you can see a lot of good collaboration. In the periphery, it may be different. Um, but I think now, like when we do our fellow boot camp and we have all the fellows coming together, that's when we really introduce it, that we're all in this together. The uh, cardiac anesthesiologists, the cardiologists, the vascular surgery fellows, the um, cardiac th surgery fellows, that's how we introduce it to our fellows in early August, and it just keeps, the collaboration keeps going from there. And so I think it's a very uh, important part of the training program. Yeah, I think that, I mean, that's the future. And that, you know, if that's the only thing you want to take away from your time here in Houston, that's probably an incredible point you've just heard. I mean, that's where, the, that's where it's going. And if you can, you know, if you, uh, if you can stay on that, in that space, um, I'm talking now to you know the next generation here. Um, there's a magical space that you want to live in, which is what does your what do your patients need? All right, what are you passionate about, and what are you good at? Those are the three things. So think of them as three circles, and and where they overlap is that magical space, right? Because you're you're passionate about something that you're actually good at. That's important, right? You've got to be good at it too. So you bring your passion, your skill, to something that actually is important. Your institution values it, right? The patients need it. So in, in, in cardiovascular medicine, our patients need us, right? At least uh, because they have acute issues. No blood pressure or no cardiac output. I mean, there, there's no high, you know, it's a high priority. So if you're passionate about it, uh, then to remain good at it, it becomes the question, right? Because your passion, you, you, it's either there or it isn't, right? The priority is there. It will always be there. I mean, it, it drove Michael DeBakey, it drives me, it drives all of us. So the third one is how do you remain good? And I think that's what Elizabeth's getting at, right? You remain good by obviously hard work, Staying in touch with the, with, with the innovations, embracing them, integrating them, and working in a team. Being able to listen to the surgeon, or being able to listen to the cardiologist, or listen to your nurse, or listen to the family. You've got to listen to everybody carefully. And then, because then the, 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 the choices that you make and the directions you take will be very, very good and will be, uh, you know, will resonate with all the stakeholders for that particular patient. And, um, and it may not always be the outcome you want, but it's, it's the best outcome because it will be based on what everybody sees and what everybody thinks. You know, we can't save everybody. I, I would like... 
I would like to speak to uh, your idea of uh, the training programs. Yes, sir. I started medical school in 1956. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The dean at our uh, get-together said to us as a group, one of the things he said to us as a group was, uh, we're not going to teach you how to practice medicine because everything that we tell you in 10 years is going to be obsolete. We're going to teach you about human biology. Uh, I think the training programs as we have them today are very much involved with process and mechanics. How do you use an ECMO? How do you put a valve in transarterially? That's all that's important, but that's ephemeral. It comes and it goes. Something else will come to replace an ECMO. What we really need to teach people is how to be physicians. We need to teach people, even residents and fellows, we need to teach people about normal physiology and pathophysiology so they understand why it is that we need an ECMO. And that if, if they understand that, then the next question is, when they see somebody, I wonder what's going on here in terms of pathophysiology and how do we get back to approximate normality. And the, the training programs, you know, about three, four, five, six years ago at this conference, I spoke up, and I don't know, people may not have liked this, but I said, you know, you're training people how to do uh, laparoscopic something what happens when ultimately, ultimately, you're going to have to open up an abdomen and do this thing the old-fashioned way? You might have to call a surgeon to do that, a real surgeon. So I think, I think your plea should be much more basic. We need to teach people how to be physicians who happen to be cardiologists or happen to be anesthesiologists or happen to be uh, cardiovascular surgeons. Yeah, I actually, I think I think you're right. Um, I, I can still, you know, sometimes I'll, you know, I'll walk in to my first day in a unit, and there's a there's a, a chaotic situation, and nobody really wants to own it for some reason, and you know, and I just sit down, and I said, you know, and I call the family in, and we start talking. I said, well, look, you know, I I, I, said, I don't really know what's going on here, but you know, I see a couple of things that I'm. You know, and I just start a conversation, and I think that speaks to what you're getting at. Sometimes you primarily need to remember you're a doctor, you know, and yes, you may have you know an amazing knowledge of a, a small piece of it, but you have to be uh, humble, accessible, and willing to to speak up. Uh, also, willing to say what you know, what you don't know. It's okay not to know. I'm happy to make a phone call to one of my colleagues. Say, hey, help me with the ECMA. Or, you know, I'm doing a TEE and I, I don't really know if there's a paravalvular leak or not. You know, I'm, 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 I'm okay getting a second opinion. I don't mind if somebody knows more than me about something. But, uh, you know, that kind of, that, that kind of the ability to have that conversation and to think in terms of, I'm just adding one little piece to what you said. And I think what I'm trying to say is the humanity. Besides the physiology, the pathophysiology, and thinking about the bigger picture, I think you also have to have that humanity in, in the piece. In other words, at the end of the day, you're somebody that the family and the patient can talk to, you know, and say, hey, doc, you know, do you, is this really what I should be doing? And I've had some conversations in the ICU where, you know, the patients, you know, I had a patient who had, you know, very severe coronary diseases, 80, 82 years old, had a, had a STEMI, and he was being offered, you know, um, PCI options, cabbage options. And I was taking care of him in the, in, in the unit because, you know, he, he was recovering from ACS. And, and we got chatting. And he says, like, you know, what do you think I should do? I said, well, you know, what I think you should do is probably not what anybody else is going to tell you. He says, well, what? So I sat down and we had a cup of coffee. I said, I would just go home. You're 82 years old, you know, you're, you're healthy still, you don't have long, but why, it's all about making the most of the time you have, you know. What do you like to do? Go fishing or get on a cruise ship? 
You know, you go to the cath lab, you go, you go into the OR, there's no guarantee what's going to happen after that. You may be stuck here. You may never get out of here. Your kidneys may, you know, you had a creatinine of two and a half. You know, I said, I'm talking to you like I would talk to my grandfather, you know. And I said, I, you know, I, 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 my colleagues may not appreciate that, but that's how I feel personally, you know. I'm all for this stuff, but, you know, at your age with where you're at, gee, you know what, take a few tablets and, yeah, he signed out about two days later. He just, he came back and said, I thought about what you said and I'm going to buy a new fishing rod, I'm going to Montana and I'm going to do some trout fishing for a long time. <laughs> that's what he did. You know, you know, and I think that speaks to what you're getting at. And you know, and I, I'm not sure if I was popular with the cardiology folks or the cardiac surgery folks, but you know, we sort of we've been working together for such a long time that I don't really, you know, I don't, I don't really care. I mean, <laughs> they've shouted at me, I've shouted at them, you know, and we still respect each other and we work together all the time. And we don't. It's okay to disagree sometimes, but I think the patient. Your patient deserves to be fully informed, and the patient should make a choice. And even if it's a even if it's a choice that puts you uh, at you know at odds with your colleagues, who you, you know, um, if, if 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 you're advocating for the patient, then everybody eventually gets behind that. You know, and if they don't, then they should. You know, so I think that's. That's what I understood from where you were coming from. I hope that sort of rounds out a little bit where, where you're at. But I'm in the same place. And that's probably, that's the way I was trained, you know, in Cape Town. It was always about being a doctor first and then, you know, being good at, at, at a little piece of it. But you had to first be, you know, a kind of person who could listen to the patient, examine the patient. And, um, and uh, unfortunately, that's kind of getting forgotten. And I think, it, I think for the reasons you've heard, it's, it's something you should always keep at the top of the, top of the list. Um, I have one more story, which I think we'll speak to it and then we'll probably wrap it up. Is, you know, training in the developing world where you have very, very few resources, you know, here you have, you have everything, right? So when, when, in my internship, I, I, was in the, I was in the intensive care unit at a, at a hospital like this in America, and uh, I, I don't have to give names. And uh, this, this uh, critically old man rolled in. He was like 50, 70. He had, you know, he was in shock. He had a ruptured, uh, a ruptured colon. He was on, you know, five presses, blue, um, you know, aneuric. And the surgeons were firing up the OR. They were ready to go, you know, and um, you know, bludgeoning the family, you know, he has to go to the OR, you know, we have to like take the, do a colectomy uh, so that, you know, we can deal with the problem. So they were, you know, so they were also, I was the intern and I was as white as a sheet. And, you know, so the, the attending said to me, like, what's wrong? And I said, well, I said, you know, I, I'm very new here, so I'm, I don't speak up, you know. He said, no, tell me what's the problem. I said, I think it's a mistake. He said, why? Because he's, you know, you can go take the colon out, but he's still dead. You know, he's on five presses, he's blue. You know, we didn't have ECMO and VADs. This was, you know, mid early 90s. So he said, well, what do you want to do? I said, I'd like to call his wife and his son and tell them that dad has an 80, you know, yes, that you can get him through the OR, but he has pretty much 100% mortality in the next month, no matter what we do. And dad may have to have his hand chopped off. He uh, may have to have his foot chopped off. He may have to have a dialysis. Um, he's never leaving the intensive care unit. He's probably going to get tracked. And, you know, and, and, and I wouldn't want that for my dad. I just wouldn't. I said, but that's me. You know, I grew up in South Africa. And, you know, I'm, I'm ready to wheel the patient to the OR because you guys are in charge. And there was just like an awkward silence in the room, you know. And the, the, my attending said, please make that phone call. So I went and I called the surgeons who were like, you know, getting upset because they were holding an OR and a whole nine yards. I made the phone call and I called the attending home and I said, the wife just wants to stop. He said, well, I, I think you're right. So we, we, we spoke to her. We, uh, now she was a couple of hours out because she was driving down. She, 
I, I said, we'll wait till you get here. She came in, she sat down. We talked to her. We, she, we talked about how we would end it. And then we, we sat down with her and we ended it. Turned everything off. Talked to him, said prayers for him. And he, and he, he went, you know. So it, it was such a profound case for me because it was, um, uh, you know, it was just a, it was just a clash of compassion and technology, you know, which is what you see here in America. Because, you know, you, you, I'm, I'm a citizen now, so I, you know, it's we, right? We have so much money, so much technology, but as, as you heard from the from the gentleman there, you know, does that mean we should lose our judgment? and our discernment, and our humanity, and I, I don't think we should. So I'll finish there. Thank you very much.